Are you clear you are on the right spiritual path? Great question we're going to answer today on episode number 56. The question we'll answer is how do we seek and find the right spiritual path? on The Debbie and Dr. Rob Show. So stay tuned. This is The Debbie and Dr. Rob Show. You are in the right place if you are tired of the basic self-help and you're ready for a higher level of teaching in neuroscience, Jungian psychology, and Eastern wisdom. We offer world-class personal development and coach training for evolving women entrepreneurs to help you go to the next level of growth in success, relationships, and living your purpose. So let's get started. Hi, this is Debbie and Dr. Rob's show, and we have a great topic today. Hi, Rob. Good to be here. Uh, What is the topic for today? Um, It's finding, seeking, and finding your spiritual path. Ah, yes. So how do we do that? How do we, we get questions like that all the time from our listeners. They say, how do I find my spiritual path? How do I know I'm on the right path? So much out there. And so we're going to talk about that. Yeah. So, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, how did you start to, when you were starting out? When I was little. <laughs> uh, well, I was raised Catholic, Roman Catholic, so my spiritual path that was my or- family origin was go to church, um, explore, you know, pray a lot, and if God blesses you and feels it's right, you'll get the things you pray for. Mm-hmm. And so it was all about being a good girl, don't make any mistakes, don't be bad, ask for forgiveness, be a good Christian, and good things will happen to you, which was great uh, until I was in my 20s, and I was so terrified of not making Mass Mm. that I would do anything just to make sure I was there, because I thought if I missed one one week of church, (laughs) that God would punish me and I'd be single forever. But what I discovered, too, was that it wasn't giving me the answers that I needed to apply in my personal life. Mm. And um, I had a really bad relationship, and uh, the sister of the guy I was dating actually gave me a book called You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. And it was a self-help book. I'd never read self-help before. And the first thing she said was that your thoughts create your life. And I said, my thoughts create my life. I thought God was in charge. Mm. And it really changed the power from feeling this like powerless person to, you know, praying and hoping that, you know, I'll be blessed to actually, I can have a say. I can ask for what I want. Right. And, I, and my thoughts are actually creating more of my problems than me just being a bad Christian or a bad person or making sin. And so it really fit for me really well. And that started my path of trying to Mm. read a ton of self-help books. They didn't have the internet back then. So I had to go to the bookstore and try to figure out how my, my life wasn't working. And I really do believe that if I had met someone and got married at 23, I don't think I would have been on a spiritual path that I am. So I I actually think it's a gift when we have these Mm. kind of questions in life or things aren't working out because it drives us to seek. How about you? Well, I mean, I guess I came across a lot of the same New Age ideas that you did, maybe a little (laughs) bit differently. Uh, (laughs) But uh, there is a connection because Carl Jung, um, my let's say my mentor in psychology uh, is considered the the grandfather or the father of the new age. Ah. <laughs> and, and so a lot of the, the books that you read, like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Louise Hay, uh, was probably influenced directly or indirectly by Carl Jung. Um, and so, yeah, one of the first books that I uh, came across that really inspired me was the Portable Jung Oh yeah, which is really Carl Carl Jung's work, uh, edited by Joseph Campbell, the, the mythologist, uh, and the other one was the Gita, the Bhagavad mm. Gita, which was uh, the teachings of Krishna, and um, those two books really kind of formed the foundation of the rest of my life. Uh, one was my academic uh, training in psychology; the other one was kind of my spiritual path along an Eastern philosophy uh, path. Mm. 
And I kind of did a lot, some Eastern philosophy. I was more in the New Age. I lived in Colorado, so there's a lot of New Age people and mm-hmm. crystals and healing and energy healing. And so I did a lot of that stuff trying to, you know, heal my, take a negative energy out and, and clear myself so I can find love. And um, I remember I would read tons of books. It was like any news a new author comes out, Marianne Williamson or Wayne Dyer, I would always get the book Mm. and had tons of books. And when I met you, you said to me, uh, I said, oh, have you read Wayne Dyer? Have you read, you know, this book? And you you said to me, oh, I don't read any of those kind of books. You said, I go right to the source. And that was the first time I ever heard that. I thought that this is how everyone does spiritual work. And so you either read the Bible or, you know, and, and stay with your religion or you do the self-help version. And I, um, and you gave me the book, The Way of the Bodhisattva, and I read it and I was completely confused, but oh, yeah. I knew there was something there. There was something that was different about it. And I, the more I studied Eastern mm-hmm. philosophy, it really started to gel. And what it did was it gave me a foundation so then I could see all this surface stuff that was on top and say, oh, that doesn't fit anymore. And that doesn't fit anymore. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the pruning that happens when we're kids. Our brain Mm -hmm. has all these ideas and then it kind of prunes away and and takes away all the things that are, don't fit in anymore or don't, aren't useful. And I felt like I had so many different philosophies and teachers that I followed. And then it started pruning and pruning and pruning until I started really focusing on Vedanta and when I did that, I feel like everything changed in a rapid way. I th- feel like things started happening. Um, like yeah. I was able to create my life in a better way. And so what we talk about with the spiritual path is the seeking is a very important part of it. You're going to talk about um, why we seek mm. and the difference between seeking and finding. And that when you're in your seeking mode, you're not going to get much trajectory in your life. You're going to be seeking and it's going to feel a little confusing for a while. When you find, that's when that foundation comes in, the tracks are set for you and you start to move forward in your life. Yeah. The, I, I, from the, let's, let's say from the spiritual psychology perspective, the, the seeking is, is an essential part. Mm. And, uh, and it's okay when you're in that seeking mode to take your time with it and to really allow yourself to be a little skeptical, a little confused, a little, you know, uh, uh, that's what seeking is. Mm-hmm. It's, it's essentially saying, I don't really know what I believe. Mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, I, I, I don't claim any particular path, any particular religion right now. Because I'm in that questioning mode, mm-hmm. and, and it's right to just take your time with it and and seek and ask the right questions. Uh, a lot of people give up though, uh, mm-hmm. you know, because they the answers don't come easily or don't come in a let's say a prepackaged. Uh, they didn't get way. Santa didn't bring their gifts. <laughs> right, right, uh, and it, and it often um, uh, let's say it, it, it's painful in a way to. To be in that mode of questioning. Mm, constantly and not getting the answer. Right. And I know you had said that it's sort of like you're digging holes. Like if you keep changing uh, your paths, it's okay for a little bit. But if right. you keep staying there, you're going to dig a shallow hole. And your ego is actually designed to keep you from the truth. All right. It's a metaphor that says mm. that uh, the, the seeker who keeps changing path is like a person trying to dig a well to, to find water, but they stop at about three feet and then start another hole. And so by the end of the, let's say the, the, the year or something, mm-hmm. they've, they've dug four or five holes, but haven't hit the water because mm-hmm. they keep changing mm-hmm. to, you know, to the next one. And it's almost like when they just get close to something really good, yeah. they see a shiny object and it's the ego going, Ooh, look over there. Look at this new video that's out by this mm-hmm. new teacher, and they have this new brand best-selling book, and that, now follow that person. And I just remember, and you can see this happening online. You see people, it's like a, a flood, a momentum toward a, a teacher, uh, a 
he has a great book out. I mean, remember Eat, Pray, Love. Everyone was in the Eat, Pray, Love mood for a while. And then there, you know, there was another uh, book and then everyone's into that. And, and then this author has a book and then everyone's doing, you know, Eckhart Tolle. And, and then we all kind of go, it's like the masses kind of gel to that, the, the, the next big thing. Right. But then what happens is we get, we don't go deep enough. And then since we're not deep enough, the roots mm. of that understanding don't keep us there. And we really need to go a little deeper. And that's, yeah. and I, I always say that when you're finding that path, it's the path that you don't leave, even when things get tough, then you know you found your right path because you love the path, you understand it, you believe in it. And so let's talk about what, or what, how, how do you know if it matches your belief? How do you know what we believe? So uh, let's <laughs> well, go deeper. L- let's say it's let's go to the water. One way to think about it is what is your worldview? Mm. And is your worldview consistent? Because, you know, we run into people all the time that are presenting a certain idea. But if you start to examine their ideas, uh, they appear to be contradicting themselves. Mm. They might say, well, I believe in oneness or in spiritual uh, power, but um, there's negative things out there are trying to hurt me. Yes. Right? There's spirits or negative energy that's... And, and so that doesn't make sense because they're contradicting themselves in, mm-hmm. in, in kind of buying into this... Uh, this worldview that both is one and at the same time dualistic. Well, a, a good example of that is if you're, I'm a spiritual being, but there's things I need to be afraid of. Mm-hmm. There's things externally from me that are are a threat to me. That if we understand what the true spiritual being is, oneness, then you're not seeing that separation. You're not feeling that there's something else coming in. You are everything. And so there, it's just a really different way to do it. And what I see, I think, what happens, same thing with psychology. It's been high, self-help has been hijacked by psych, psychology. But I think religion has some way, creeps its way into spiritual work. And then people make it religious or, or the, the religion in itself starts to distort our ideas, even new consciousness ideas, the ideas of law of attraction and um, how to... Uh, you know, create your life, uh, the, it, it actually gets a little re- religious versus sure. phil- philosophical. Right, right. So one of the most common, um, let's say, worldviews out there mm-hmm. uh, is the materialistic worldview. And often it's a dualistic because they, they, th- they say, well, there's the material world, but then there's a spiritual world as well. Mm. Yes. And, and those two things are... Are dual, right? Mm-hmm. They're saying there's two two elements here: uh, a material world and a spiritual world, and how those interact then becomes the question. And often, they they don't have a really good understanding or philosophy as to how that interaction happens, mm-hmm. and so they it's an incomplete worldview to say the least. So is it sort of like this idea that in science matter? Uh, there's matter and then there's consciousness and that arises out of matter? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, the dualistic? It, yeah in the West for a long time, the, the, this idea that uh, our brain is so complex. So we have, uh, you know, 100 billion neurons firing at, you know, at once or, or in different sequences. And out of that complicated interaction of these neurons, we get what is called consciousness meaning awareness, just we're aware of ourselves, of the world, of the universe. Now, that, for most people, it makes like intuitive sense Mm -hmm. that, yeah, of course, when I wake up in the morning, I was asleep, and then when I woke up, I see the world as it appears to me. Now, that's, I'm conscious, I'm aware. But... uh, even in, in science now, with the new physics uh, coming in, uh, quantum physics especially, and, and even in, um, in the way we perceive, let's say in perceptual sciences, it, that's not really what happens in consciousness or the way we experience the world. The way it really happens is that our, our brain actually makes up a 3D model in our head about the world and 
how it works and everything. And then that's what we're experiencing. We don't, do not have direct access to the physical world out there. It is essentially a, a mental experience that we're creating. It's so mind-blowing, right? It is. And, and that's, uh, that's qu- quantum physics is, it talks about that. Mm-hmm. We didn't know that maybe 100 years ago. Right. And so, but the ancients knew it. The, the, uh, yes. East, and so that's where we're, we're seeing that science moving back into, right. into the spiritual realm. Yes, and if we look at the East, uh, they've always presented, um, let's say in general, there are different philosophies, but in general, this idea that everything is consciousness. Mm-hmm. Meaning they, they understood this principle that we are dealing with essentially with a mental experience of the world. Uh, a world that's created in consciousness. And they've gone with that for, especially in Vedanta, um, for many, many uh, centuries and thousands of years now, that uh, it is conscious. It is a conscious universe that we're dealing with. So these two worldviews are really what's shaping the way science and religion or faith has been playing out, in, uh, especially in re- recent years. So dual... Or non-dual, those yes. two realities. So that's really a good basis for what is your path? Do you believe in a dual reality where you're the separate being, separate from God, mm-hmm. separate from the external world, the law of attraction kind of, I'm going to hold a vision and my vibration's going to go out and pull someone something in? Or do you believe in the non-dual, which is that you are consciousness wow. and that what you're experiencing is your own mind? Uh this is what Eastern philosophy has discovered and science has discovered. So it almost makes sense to start thinking about, is that, would that be a better experience for me and more empowering for mm. me? And what, um, what we know is, and what I, where I got lost for a long time, and I still sometimes forget that I'm one with everything, that the world it does feel separate. So we have to keep reminding ourselves that it's not. But there's a lot of books and, and psychologies and, and new age stuff and scientific uh, ideas that are in contrast to that. And they, they th- see everything du- in dualistic terms. Right. And so you have to ask yourself, which side am I on? Am I on the, the dual side or the non-dual side? And then you could start looking at paths that match that. And what you'll notice is once you pick a path, and this is something that I've noticed for myself, is that when I picked, when I started being really clear on what I believed, that I believed in oneness, I believed that consciousness arises from me, that there isn't a separate independent reality that is influencing me, that I don't have any, you know, maybe I'm not conscious of it, but I still have access to it. That is empowering to me. And when I read other books or I, I see other philosophies, I can, again, prune away mm-hmm. and say, nope, this, I don't have to get distracted with this. Or right. that, that looks, this book looks distracting to me away from my core view. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of, I don't think people talk about this. And that's why people are so confused. And we, I talk to people all the time and they're like, I've done, you know, 20 courses and I'm still confused and I don't know what to believe. And we ask them, well, what do you believe? And they don't know. And that's, I think it's the most important question you can ask yourself on your spiritual path is what is it that I believe about reality and and what makes up my reality and where is my power in creating it? Yes. And when we say believe, it's not in the traditional sense because, you know, there's a interview on uh, YouTube now that uh, with uh, one of the last interviews Carl Jung gave where they ask him, you know, you've been studying uh, uh, spiritual, spirituality uh, for all these years. Do you believe in God? They mm. ask him directly. And he says, well, no, I don't believe. I know. <laughs> right? So we're talking about a direct experience of, of these spiritual matters. Not, not a belief in the traditional sense that the, you know, the church or the synagogue or the temple gave you a set of beliefs, and that's what you were going to go by, mm-hmm. but more of a way of seeking and finding your own spiritual path and having a direct experience of that reality. And the best way to do that is to keep asking questions, to have a mentor or guide that's going to help you mm-hmm. ask those tough questions that, that has the same philosophy as you. 
and look for look out for people that are just fancy objects. They have fancy names, maybe fancy videos, fancy marketing, but they're really con uh, contradicting themselves and their views. If they're confused about with their worldview, they're not going to be able to help you decide. So be really clear, and that's what's going to really uh, make big changes in your life. So you'll go from that seeking, which is really important um, in the life of Pi. Mm -hmm. He was seeking. He tried. He was in India, and he was trying all these different <laughs> religions. But he had an experience out on the water of what life was about, and that is that's part of the process. So if you're seeking. You're, you're on the right path, as long as you're asking those questions. But when you find and you make a decision that this is what I want, I'm, I'm a dualistic per, uh, philosophy or I'm a oneness philosophy, non-dual, then you're going to see huge changes. And it's going to basically clear the clutter in your mind of, does this work for me? Should I try this, this kind of technique? And should I follow this teacher? Should I buy this book? Um, it's all going to make a lot more sense to you. So that's why we wanted to have this call because this class, because it really is so important. It, it all starts here with your worldview and your spiritual philosophy. Absolutely. So um, what a great show. If you have any questions about this, any uh, you know, contradictions to what, you, what you've learned and, and want to test it out, uh, visit us on our Facebook group. It's Debbie and Dr. Rob show. Just search for us in Facebook and you'll, you'll see us. You'll join our group and feel free to um, ask us questions. Tell us what other topics you'd like us to speak about yeah. and find out more about us at Debbie and Dr. Rob .com. We have events coming up this year, uh, coming into 2019. We also have some uh, really great programs that you might be interested in as well. If you're ready to do, join the oneness bandwagon. <laughs> The non-dualistic... The non-dualistic bandwagon. Yeah. And so thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you on Facebook. Take care, everyone. Thanks for coming. You've been listening to The Debbie and Dr. Rob Show. To find out more about us, you can visit us on our website at debbieandrob.com. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play. We'd love to see you on every show, and thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you remember to believe in your biggest dreams.